Jaron Lanier is considered one of the fathers of virtual reality and a veteran of Silicon Valley. And he says social media and its algorithms are harming your health. In his book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, Lanier contends that sites like Facebook and Twitter are dopamine farms that are reprogramming how you think and feel. He says they're also causing political instability and are changing the global economy for the worse. Well, joining me now from Seattle, Washington, is computer scientist, inventor of VR, is even a classical composer, Jaron Lanier. Good to have you on the program, Jaron. Tell me why we should unplug. Tell me why we should Thank delete so our social media me. accounts. Ah, well, there are 10 reasons, okay? <laughs> One reason is that uh, scientific studies have shown that even though it's hard to delete your accounts, when you do, you get happier. Uh, you get more productive, you have more time. Uh, but that might be the least of the reasons. When a lot of people do, their society becomes better, it becomes more peaceful. Uh, uh, people believe in facts more instead of silly conspiracy theories. Um, what's amazing is that just this one technology seems to have made every layer of life worse. Mm -hmm. But since we're all addicted to it, it's hard to see that. Right. And so, full disclosure, one of the great perks of my job is that I can read a book and then come and talk to my team and say, hey, I read this book, it's fantastic, we should get the author on. That's exactly what happened with your book. I read it about a month ago. While I was reading it, it was actually, I posted my, my last tweet about a month ago. And I said, guys, this could be my last tweet because <laughs> the book was so compelling, your arguments were so strong, right? So I haven't tweeted in a month. I haven't gone onto Facebook, I haven't uh, gone into my Instagram. I've left them idle. I haven't deleted them yet, but I found it really compelling. Now, I might be a convert. I don't know. I'm sort of in this in-between phase. I will agree that I've read more <laughs> in the past month. I've read loads of books, and I've found, for me personally, I've found my concentration back. I've been able to concentrate a bit better, right? Be that as it may, there's something a bit more nefarious that you talk about in, in the book. You talk about the fact that it's social media is manufacturing in a, in, a, in a terrible way, it's, it's making us behave differently and it's, it's designing bad behavior or unnatural behavior. Now help me understand that and explain that properly. Sure, well, in, this, in the uh, business models for companies like Facebook and Twitter, but also I have to say for Google, um, the only product that they make money from essentially is the ability to persuade and change the behaviors of their users. So you're not the customer of these things. The customer is the advertiser off to the mm -hmm. side, and the advertiser believes that they're able to gain some kind of uh, modification in what you do, what you think. And it's sneaky. It, you don't understand all that's being done to you. Very strange behavior modification algorithms are being applied, and all this data that's being taken is what feeds those algorithms. Now, the problem with this is that if you have a society where anytime two people do something together, the only way that's financed is because of a third person who wants to manipulate them, you end up with an entire society optimized for manipulation, for sneakiness, for trickiness. And so what you do is you open it up to all kinds of bad actors to come in and create divisions, ruin elections, uh, make politics insane. Um, and uh, I have to say, we've seen so many examples of that that it's crazy to deny it anymore. Um, if you ask how how did an organization like ISIS become so powerful so quickly? Well, it's because the social media technology is designed to amplify exactly the worst people. If you ask why is violence returning to areas that had been gradually becoming more peaceful in rural India and Southeast Asia and parts of Africa, once again, we see the same phenomenon. Social media arrives and then the violence follows. Um, and uh, they're just too, they're too many examples mm -hmm. to give. To, I, I think it's it, so. So the, the thing is, though, that people are genuinely addicted. The addiction is technically very similar to gambling addiction. Right. When somebody becomes addicted to gambling, they don't want to believe it. They think they're in control, but they're not. And so since everybody's addicted to this stuff, when you talk to them about it, it's very hard for them to understand because they're addicted. It's essentially a form of being hypnotized, but by a hypnotist who's working for somebody else. Right. It's a very strange situation. Okay, so we're addicted, that's fine. We get these dopamine hits from people liking our <laughs> pouty selfies or you know our posts of our kids or whatever, even if it's, if it's well-intentioned. 
we're, we're addicted to our own echo chamber and people validating our thoughts and all of that. But on the other side of this, and this is a crucial point, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google and so on, are they deliberately nefariously trying to modify our behavior and make us into bad addicted people or is it just a byproduct of good intentions gone bad? This is a fascinating question. Okay, so the, the first president of Facebook, somebody named Sean Parker, now says that they understood they were intentionally doing something bad. But the thing is, I knew him at the time when Facebook was starting and he was the president of it. And I really believe they didn't understand it and it was good intentions gone bad. And so this leaves me with a mystery. Is he remembering himself as being more of an evil James Bond villain kind of a person because it's glamorous? I, I really, it's very hard to figure that out. Um, I'm very confident that Jack Dorsey and the other people at Twitter did not realize they were doing something bad and they were caught by surprise and now are having trouble figuring out what to do. And I think they're sincere. Um, I also feel that's true about the Google people who I knew and I actually sold a company to them when they were just starting. Uh, I believe that they did not understand the depth of the mistake they were making. I'm not sure if anybody fully did. Um, but in the case of Facebook, Facebook, maybe they did. At least some of them say they did. A lot of people just say, listen, I use Twitter for, for work and for keeping up with the news. I use Facebook and Instagram for friends and family and being sociable. What's the big deal? Aren't you a bit of an extremist, Jaron? Uh, or even to me, like, what's wrong with you? Why are you taking yourself so seriously by, by unplugging, either by, by leaving it idle or by, by leaving altogether? So what? Just reduce the amount of time you spend on these things, what's wrong with you? Don't you have willpower? Don't they have a point? Well, the thing is that people aren't aware of most of what happens. Your immediate experience of using uh, these tools might be quite positive. And indeed, um, from my perspective, this ability to connect with friends and all that sort of thing is just intrinsic to the Internet. Uh, that's, what, that's all good and that's all authentic. Um, the main thing that goes on that I'm concerned about is something that you are by design not aware of, which is the modification of your own behavior, because it happens very sneakily and very subtly using the techniques of what's called behaviorism, a branch of science that studies how to change the behavior of organisms uh, like people. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, you know, what this is analogous to for me is in the past, society has faced problems where there was mass addiction. And even though everybody was addicted and even though it was hard, we somehow were able to face up to it. And a very obvious example to me is cigarette smoking, which is greatly reduced, uh, even though everybody used to smoke all the time everywhere. Another example is uh, alcohol. Um, uh, we've had a campaign in uh, most of the world to prevent people at least from driving drunk because it used to kill so many people and actually that's worked you know that turned out to be intelligent and was accepted so I think in the same way when we start to have a wider realization of how pr troublesome these things are um, not only will some people leave but when those people leave they'll create the space in the society for conversation and I'm fully confident that these services will improve eventually and they'll improve enough that I won't feel you need to delete them anymore. <laughs> but right now, it really is important for the health of society for people to become aware of the degradation that's going on. For those who would say, well, if there are a billion people using a social media network and say a hundred million of us stop posting that much and another hundred million delete, you still have 800 million people who are completely addicted and feeding the beast and what impact is staying off social media going to actually have? Are they really going to listen in Google and Twitter and Facebook? Even if only a minority of people um, become skeptics of the social media technologies and delete their accounts, that minority is enough to have the conversation. Look, here's the analogy I would make. If absolutely every single person in a society is a drunk, it's going to be impossible to have a conversation about the problems of alcoholism, mm -hmm. right? Um, there needs to be at least, there has to be somebody who's sober <laughs> in order to even start that conversation. That, that seems to me to be simple logic. So in this case, uh, there has to be just some subset, some minority of people who are not addicted to these technologies, and then we can have a conversation. And out of that conversation will come better technologies and a more moderate and survivable form of them. So I'm social media teetotal for the moment, or... Tweet total, uh, for the moment. I just made that up. It's a horrible dad joke, and I apologize. But so, would you um, would you allow us 
from the from the show's Twitter and Facebook account to share this interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'll tell you one thing. Um, I never tell anybody else what to do. In fact, in the, in the book, I'm very clear, and I repeat it many times. I don't know you, and for an individual, it might be that keeping their social media accounts is the right idea or whatever. It's not my job to judge individuals, but it is your job to know yourself. It well, is your job yeah. to experience yourself without addiction. It is your job to make, uh, to make judgments. So I have to leave it to you. Okay, I'm we're going we're gonna to share the interview. Jaron, it's been a pleasure talking to you.